Uh, today we have uh, Director Richard Shenning. Uh, Director Shenning is the EMS Director for Baltimore County Fire Department, responsible for the administrative oversight of the EMS Division, and is currently working with emergency management to address the COVID-19 outbreak. Director Shenning, thank you. Thank you guys very much. Um, I, I really want to just have a couple seconds, and I called Sean and said, hey, if you guys have any time on these Thursday night series, I just want to come and talk to you. It's a very hot topic that's going on right now. There's a lot of misinformation that's going on about the, um, about the COVID-19 um, outbreak that's going on. Anything that I say today, please bear with me. If Don't fact check me, because it's probably changing by the minute. Today, I was actually given a little thing talking about that there's been no community spread. This, I didn't even finish the sentence, and somebody was going, I just got a text, there's community spread now. The governor just, within the same sentence, I couldn't even get it out. So this stuff is changing rapidly. And my goal here is just to kind of give you some stuff. Hopefully, you guys have seen some things that are going on in the county. I mean, just to flip on the news, that's all you're seeing now, where they're changing, they're closing schools. And we'll talk just a little bit about what, um, some of the reasons what they're, why they're doing some of this stuff and what our goal is and what we're concerned about um, with EMS, with the fire service and stuff. But I want to talk about just the importance of first responders and a public health response. I actually wish Terry were here tonight. He's really good with this kind of stuff. Um, and then provide just a brief update on the COVID-19 virus. So just discuss some of the stuff that we're doing as a department um, to address some of this stuff. We just turned on 911 um, screening over at the 911 center. So one of the reasons we kind of held off on that a little bit is because we wanted to have the most updated information. We wanted something, at least a case in Maryland. But and then when we did have turn that on for that we were screening and somebody identifies a person under investigation, we wanted to be able to give some tools to say when that happens, what does a provider do? So it's, it's great to screen it, but if you have no action coming from it. So we'll talk a little bit about some of the um, expectations that we'll be doing with those things, um, steps to take, and then a little bit just the leadership of us as being um, role models out in the community. Um, so understand that there's just a lot of stuff we don't know about this virus. Okay, it's called a novel virus because it's new. And the last time that they had a new type flu virus that went around um, that reached pandemic proportions was probably back in 1918. And that wiped off about a third of the world's population. Okay, this, if anybody heard of that, the um, flu back in 1918. Now, do we think that that's going to happen this time? No, we have a much different system than we have. Um, healthcare system that we have now, we have antivirals, we have a lot of different stuff. But what, probably what you're hearing a lot of is people are really fixating on this thing called community spread or is it travel related. So right now they're really in a tr still attempting to contain this virus. Um, and it still can be done. That's why everything that you're seeing that's hitting out in the news right now is closing mass gatherings. Um, it, it really is tr hard to follow something this because most people got into EMS for this couple minutes later. Really the stuff I'm going to talk about really is it's washing your hands. There are very little things that we can do in the hope that we can contain this so that it doesn't have some of the effects that we think it may have if we can't contain it. So just to talk about that. What we don't know, we don't know when this is going to peak. We don't know when it's going to end. All right. So there's a lot, there's theories thinking that, hey, at first, hey, let's not worry about this quite so much because why we think that just like the seasonal flu, it'll die off in around May and then we won't see it again until next October. We just don't know that. It may stick around all summer long. Um, this, we may be really busy the next couple of months. God bless you. Thank you for doing it into your things. See, you can leave. You can give you a certificate. You already coughed in. <laughs> and, and this is really tough right now, too, because um, anybody have allergies? You're probably getting them early this year. It's been a really warm year. Allergies are coming a little bit earlier. It's still the height of flu season. We're still getting a lot of flu cases. So a lot of this stuff mimics other things. Um, we don't really know how long it lives on surfaces. We're learning a lot more day, day to day um, as we're getting more information about this stuff. Um, but some things that we're concerned about is how's it going to affect our workforce? If this does continue to go on, there's called an R naught thing about how fast it replicates and how fast it spreads, stuff like that. If this were to go to continue, some of the things that we're reading is saying 20 to 30 percent of our workforce may be out of work at any one time. Now, I don't know many places that can take a hit of 30 percent of their workforce, but out of that, two to five percent people may be hospitalized. Now, what we're learning is that may be 
the elderly people, people with more comorbid um, conditions and things like that, as they're starting to see, they're seeing that it, this one ironically doesn't affect kids like some of the other seasonal flus. They're thinking that maybe there's something with the protein and in elderly people's lungs where it attaches on, where in little kids it really doesn't attach onto the lungs and do the damage that it does. So it's, it's interesting stuff. We're learning a lot as we go on. Um, what we're telling anybody, 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 even in a fire department where we monitor sick leave pretty, pretty stringent if you're on the career side, and I don't see too many career people in here, but we monitor pretty good. But we're telling you, if you're sick, you have a cough, and you have fever, stay home. We're telling supervisors, if you come in, send them home. Okay, so same thing with the volunteers. If you're not feeling well, don't come in that day. It's not worth spreading. Um, where we're really worried about is what happens when this hits out into a nursing home or into one of those um, things. Uh, myself, Dr. Baron Holtz, we were talking a little bit before, something like this runs through a nursing home. A lot of these local hospitals don't have a whole lot of ventilators. We take somebody in, imagine taking your grandmother and your grandfather in, then you have to pick which one gets the ventilator because they may not have enough to go around. That's the kind of stuff we're trying to avoid, so we're still in containment um, activities as we're doing that. So things are changing. We monitor daily. Um, I've been moved, I am not haven't been moved, I'm with the EMS office, but primarily for the last week, week and a half, this is all I've been doing is COVID stuff. We moved Battalion Chief Bykoff up. It's all he's doing is um, stuff with funding and getting um, the thermometers that we just got, getting the funding for that kind of stuff so we can put it out. Director Ringel from Emergency Management's working with the county administration and between the three of us, and we've moved some other people up to help with this. So we're taking it really serious. Um, I want to get out and try to spread some of these words to people. So people you know, are hearing facts. There is a ton of misinformation out. The latest I heard today is the Hopkins site that, you know, if anybody went in there, it looks like it got the measles um, because red dots are popping up everywhere that you look. Um, people are now taking that site and changing it around and changing the numbers and putting it out. Um, on social media. So, you know, in a minute, I'll show you some some good sites that we can use as healthcare professionals to look at that, and you know, we can start doing a little bit of our own research with this stuff. But first responders in the public health setting, it's something we're pretty new to. We don't, we don't, we've been doing this. We're, we're trained for this by far. We've had flu seasons how many times? We've done PPE. We get. Um, we take care of infectious disease stuff, but it's not really why most people went into this. Um, line of work. Um, but we are the first line of protection and we are trained um, professionals. We're expected to be the com um, calm ones during a crisis and that's really what I'm trying to get people to do is stop some of the fears. Some of the things that they're seeing across the country where they're going in in full hazmat suits and they're containing everything and they're keeping units out of service for three, four hours cleaning up afterwards. That's probably a lot of overkill on that kind of stuff. The um, I always say we, you know, the state of emergencies that have been declared. They do that so they can free up funding and resources so we can still help manage this. But they did not declare a state of panic. Okay, and we're seeing little bits and pieces of that that are popping up. So I'm trying to get out as much as I can to talk to people with this. But we do touch a lot of people in the healthcare setting. Think about it. You know, the, the types of vulnerable patients we may see. Anybody go to a dialysis center recently on a medic unit? We go all the time. Cancer centers, all the time. Take care of diabetics. How about people in long-term prednisone? These are the type of people that we want to help protect so that we're not putting them into the hospital. Talk a little bit about what happens if this breaks out of containment, this goes out, and we start seeing true pandemic proportions here in the state of Maryland. There may come a time where we're um, implementing a pandemic protocol where we're not transporting to the people to the hospital. There's vulnerable patients, we will, but maybe not young, healthy people. Um, so we're still waiting, we're still working with MIMS on that kind of stuff. But you know, the one thing I do say is, and we hear this all the time, it's just the flu. They're overreacting to all this kind of stuff. Um, what we're trying to do is, as healthcare professionals, especially when we're out, if any of us are officers out with your crews, try to avoid that minimization of stuff. Because when people are going to emulate the behaviors that we do, if we go out and we act like it's nothing, everybody's going to act like it's nothing, then they're not going to wear their face mask or they're not going to wash their hands or they're not going to wear their gloves. So when we show that we're taking it serious, and we are, um, you know, we want other people to emulate the behaviors that we expect out of them. Um, and it's to keep them safe and to keep their family safe. Um, so we are the role models that go out with that. So a little bit about public health success. If we are successful, we're going to hear things like, that was a lot to do about nothing. Man, we did all this stuff and it never even hit here. It's kind of like a lineman in football. 
The only time you ever hear their name is if they miss the block. Right? So that's kind of what we're looking to do here. I'm hoping people are making fun of us six months from now, a year from now. That means we did a damn good job at, doing, at containing this. Um, if we hear that a whole lot of bad stuff happen, we missed this part of, of the um, containment plan. All right, so our solutions really are not glamorous and heroic. I'll tell you some things that we can do, but it's going to boil down to very simple, non-heroic measures. Wash your hands, cough etiquette, social distancing, um, all that kind of stuff that you're seeing. Cancel and mass events. You know, if they can just buy some time, hopefully with some of these travel restrictions, they're hoping to keep this down. We are down a little bit in the United States compared to other places, you know, but we could be Japan in just a couple weeks. Um, where we, they have a huge, or Italy, or something like that, where it's overwhelming their healthcare system right now, and that's what we're trying to avoid from, from happening. So it does require strong um, leadership. But what we're really, in the fire department, we're looking at the impact of this um, disease. What we're looking is, how does it affect continuity of operations in the fire service, our essential missions, which is, you know, there's probably going to come a time, it was announced today, I don't know if anybody saw the message, it went out from Director Roskowski, they're starting to cancel some things that are non-mission essential. Training, where we're going to bring a lot of people together. Um, classes that haven't already started at MIFRI, they're starting to cancel some of those. And that's all to buy this time. Every school on earth, I think, announced that it's closing something today. Um, that they're doing that. But also, you know, from my perspective, we're looking at continuity of government. What happens when we start closing things around? We start closing down aging. We start closing down, um, you know, you, you, just things that you're going to think about. What happens when 30% of the prison guards call off sick? 30% um, of the people that are doing meals on wheels and now there's people that can't eat and stuff like that. So this is the kind of stuff that we're looking and we're trying to prevent from happening. All right, so continuity fire department and operations and government, we're still in containment activities and this is still possible. Um, early detection and 911 screening, I'll talk about that in just a couple minutes. I got a couple slides on that. So PPE inventory. Um, hopefully everybody now, has, I sent a message out early in the week, please make sure you guys have enough PPE to go around. I can tell you every place is struggling with this right now. Every jurisdiction around us is worried about do we have enough N95 masks. You guys should all see that there's a schedule out, make sure that we're getting fit tested. There's going to come a time soon we're going to say no fit test, can't ride. Um, it, it is that important. <clears throat> um, we will do whatever we can. We're, Station 14, you know, and this is kind of a, you don't hear this a whole lot, but, you know, when I talk about trust, you guys have to really, really trust that everybody up at headquarters, the leadership of the fire department, county government, the health department is really working hard to do things to keep people safe. And I mean, we're working around the clock to do this kind of stuff. I, Director Ringgold, as the emergency manager has been named, um, is pretty much the incident commander for the, for the county to do this, and myself and Dave Bykoff are helping him, but we're working with a lot of other county agencies, and I'm telling you, these people are, Dr. Carney is the infectious disease doctor, under Dr. Branch over at the health department. I can text him in two seconds and have answers for things like that. People have really made themselves available and asked what more they can do to try to get this under control. Um, and I'm really proud of you know, the, the team effort that's going on. We talk about teamwork in the fire department. This truly has been a team effort. And we're not out in front of it yet. We're trying to. I think we've done more than what most jurisdictions are. We're in good shape, but we have a lot of work to do. And that's why I'm trying to recruit help and get out the people talk to them so that they are taking this stuff serious and protecting themselves. But, you know, like I said, we're worried about employee health and absenteeism. But there's going to come a time here soon where this is really going to overwhelm the hospitals. I look at um, response stats daily. And on a given day in, in the fire service, we run about maybe on a Monday, 350, 360 calls. Um, we transport out of that probably about 240, 250. That's a busy Monday. Um, for the first time ever in the last two weeks, I've seen two days where we've run over 400 calls in EMS. Um, we didn't transport quite that many of them, but you know we're starting to see little spikes starting to come up um, where they're hitting it. And that's fine if we can get out at hospitals, but I think anybody who's written a medic unit knew it's, sometimes, it's like flypaper. You can get in. Sometimes it's hard to get out. Um, and that's what we're worried about. When something like this happens, you know, and what, where we're getting reports of the things like this that are going on is 
you go into a hospital, you're admitted, and they're ready to send you home, but you just can't, it's an elderly person, they can't just quite go home, so they need to go to a rehab facility. But in the hospital, they had a fever. So now all of a sudden, the rehab facility says, I'm not taking them because they had a fever, so we can't get them out of the floor up at the hospital, and that's backing up into the ER. And these are the kind of things that we are really trying to avoid um, so that it doesn't create mu that much of a backlog. Almost every hospital now has its own emergency plan. I'm sure if you've been to any of the hospitals, you're seeing different things. They may have a tent there. One on the east side is stopping us up at the main road and won't even let us on the property until they take the temperature of the driver, the paramedic, and the patient. And we're not allowed to take any um, visitors with them, you know, which brings up what happens if they have little kids and things like that. So we're working through a lot of this stuff and we're working with the hospitals, but we're starting to see a lot of different stuff as they're implementing their own emergency plans at each individual hospital. Um, but again, we're starting to look at, uh, eventually it's gonna come down to allocating um, scarce resources. So why should we take this serious? All the stuff that I just say, vulnerable populations, elderly, to say something that is just the flu the just the flu and an 18 or a 20 year old and that's in college, you're gonna be fine. You know, they, and probably you will be with this as well. The flu in the elderly population that runs through a nursing home, it's also the leading cause of death in the elderly population. So to say just the flu depends on what patient demographics that we're looking at. So always you know, keep that kind of stuff in mind. Um, so some simple common stuff. stuff. Wash your hands. Um, requires diligence, social distancing, avoid large crowds. You know, um, I have my in-laws, I have my mother that's around, you know, have some medical problems and what I'm telling them, don't go out for a little bit. You know, try to stay away from big crowds, don't go out, we'll get, we'll try to get you your 90 grit toilet paper that they're selling right now, which is kind of like sandpaper, what we get in the county, but it's about the only thing you can find anymore. Um, but really that kind of stuff to protect themselves and stay away from um, some of this stuff. And that's tough if you're somebody who's already a lonely elderly person and you already have social isolation as a problem. So, you know, there's whole groups of Department of Aging that are out to socialize these people. So there are things that, are, um, that we're looking at. So the big, biggest risk is uh, minimizing this stuff. And, and that's what we, we don't want to do. So we've been monitoring this situation for a couple weeks now. Um, we've been doing a lot of preparedness activities, um, getting ready for this. You guys probably have already seen some of them. We bought thermometers. We've got some N95 masks out there. We sent out some mattress covers. Um, we sent out some additional guidance, the other things going on. I know this has already changed today. This was as of early this morning, nine cases, and there was all associated with travel. There was one announced today in Baltimore County. Um, now, there's, I heard the governor announce today that there has been at least one case of community spread in, in Maryland. Um, so we can take off the bottom bullet point, this does change um, frequently, and that's probably what led to all that stuff we were just talking about, all those school closings, all the, um, the different um, emer emergency plans are getting implemented, whether it be at a school, at a nursing home, at assisted living, um, crowd management, visitors coming into these places and stuff like that. Um, but we're really looking at evidence-based updates. We're working with local, state, just for you guys too. I don't know if anybody understands this. If Terry Sapper here today, he's normally at these. Um, he's really good at giving this update. But us as Baltimore County, we kind of take our guidance from the local health department, which is Dr. Branch and the Department of Health down off York Road. Um, they do their talking with the Maryland Department of Health who does their talking to the CDC, which gets their stuff, with, they work with the World Health Organization. I can't call up the CDC, they wouldn't even take my phone call. So we work through that kind of chain of command going up and down with guidance. <clears throat> so you'll see a lot of people that go to CDC sites, but if you guys wanna do a little bit of local research and, and get some additional information for what's here in Baltimore County, great resource. Just go to the local Baltimore County Health Department. They have a lot of really good resources on there. Um, with that. We've been briefing the county administration almost every other day. Um, it was, we did today, and now we're doing it right before the news conference. We'll be doing it again tomorrow. Dr. Branch, I don't know if anybody's ever met him, ever worked with anything that has to do with public health. He is phenomenal with this stuff. Um, we, we can call him if we have any questions, provider type issues. He gives us answers real quick. Great to work with. Um, so has the administration been um, good with that. 
We haven't done fit testing for a long time in Baltimore County. In a matter of one week, we did um, 1,200 people. So just showing you what the, our special ops team, what the hazmat crew has been doing. Hopefully during that time, they're also teaching people how to properly don and doff that um, stuff. And then we're going to talk a little bit about some conservatory stuff because that is a big concern of mine. That we are going to run out, and I believe in the hospitals, you guys are probably having the same concerns. What are we going to do when we run out? The CDC has relaxed. Uh, um, a lot of stuff. Uh, we've purchased and distributed thermometers. We um, attained some additional PPE that we do have. We're stocking up on our cleaning supplies and we have contingency plans if they run out um, where we're trying to get those. We're reviewing a lot of our policies and procedures and contingency plans in a second about the screening measures and then that. So starting Tuesday, I don't know if anybody's, we haven't had any real hits yet where they've mentioned it over the air. That's a good thing. That means that they're truly doing the screening um, per the protocol that they were given. Um, but th they started identifying people who may be a person under investigation or a PUI, PUI um, when they do that. So, you know, and I say may be there and it's in italics because it's dispatched. That's incumbent upon what the person tells them when they call. Now, we, do, we have gotten a lot. So just in the last two weeks, we have had, I want to say, well over 10 or 15, where people are calling up and they're embellishing the story so that we will run them over to an emergency department and get them tested. Um, there's a reason some of these things are in place, because we've been able to rule out most of these um, before they happen. Because when they meet the screening criteria, they really do need to meet all three. Travel question, respiratory questions, and a fever. So when you have all three of those, we can consider that a person under investigation. We haven't really gotten a whole bunch of those, but it is just a screening tool. It depends on what they're saying. Um, and it's meant to alert you guys as responders when you're going there, hey, maybe I ought to go in here a little bit more prepared. So I'll talk about some steps that we probably ought to take on a given things. Now, I understand everybody's clinical judgment depending on the patient. This is very different if it's a 22-year-old walk-in, talk-in, priority three, who you know, has a fever as a 73 that comes out as a medical box because of a decreased level of consciousness. There are two very different things. There's no way we're gonna write one set of um, things here that's gonna limit somebody's judgment. So we wanna allow that in there. That's one of the reasons that I'm going out trying to talk um, to people stuff with this. But um, it gives, hopefully it's gonna give you guys stuff before you approach them so you can help anticipate what you're gonna need. And then um, then the PPE that you're gonna need. These screening questions are changing. As of now, they still have the travel history that's in there. As this breaks out of containment, if we get something else I anticipate, it'll probably go down to just two. It'll probably just go down to the respiratory um, and the fever. And if you have those two things, that's probably gonna prompt us to do that. But as of right now, the current recommendations are still that we do that. And basically, these are the screening questions that are asked over at the 911 center. Um, if you have all three of those, they're going to identify them to you. Yes, ma'am. So we have a question online. This is the dispatch to see if the university is using it. Does it make sense for an ambulance to transfer this? No, it doesn't. Yeah, we're looking at that case. I know, I know the case <clears throat> in question. I actually called the crew at the hospital. Um, and that's what we're doing. So the recommendations and the screening that happen in EMS is a little bit different from in the hospital. So in the hospital, one of the additional screens that's going on also includes people with a fever that have a failed um, flu test and or an unexplained pneumonia. So if they have those things, so we're trying to find out if that was true. Um, I don't believe that the health department directed that, but we're looking into that. So, you know, point taken. And this, again, this is why we want to get this information out there. And it's one of the reasons that I'm out trying to talk to as many people as we can. If I know about them and they did alert me to them, we can follow up with this stuff. I have a great relationship with the um, health department as we're doing that. Um, so some steps that we can take. All right, if you get alerted that you're gonna have a person under investigation, all right, obviously, patient care stuff, put on your gloves, gown, eye protection, your N95 mask. N95 masks are for you, all right, for the responders who have been fit tested, they're a respirator. Okay, we're getting a lot of cases where people are putting on the patients. Does them no good whatsoever. Surgical mask, regular face mask on the patient, all right, and that's probably a good thing to do. You walk in, you isolate them. Ma'am, sir, you're here. You sit over there, um, give them a face mask. 
get your stuff on, and then approach them. One thing that we're asking them to do because of some conservation tech or efforts, if they're a walkie-talkie type person, maybe you only put one person in PPE, they take care of them, they go out in the back, they take them to the hospital, we only have to put one person in gear. The minimum amount of people that it takes to take care of the patient, gear them up. If you don't need the engine on that, put them in service. Don't need the supervisor, you know, they can come and keep a nice distance from that. Six feet's kind of our rule. Um, so don't get within six feet of them. You probably don't need the mask and stuff. If it's a medical box and they're really sick and everybody's got a mask up, everybody's got a mask up. But we are looking to conserve this stuff because th this is no, um, we're not exaggerating with this. We cannot buy any more masks. We're, we're, we're on rations. We've been alerted by almost every manufacturer. We'll give you some, but you may only get one case even though you ordered six cases. So we're really struggling to do that. We're hoping there are some things that are gonna open up, but as of right now, we are concerned about this and we wanna ration it, but we still wanna take care of the patient. We're trying to balance this. There, I wish I could say we had a great, way to do this, but we just don't. So I want, I want this to last as long as we can because I don't want anybody to go without protection. Um, but a simple surgical mask on the patient. And then if anybody, and every, every medic should have gotten these, this really isn't an N95 type thing. Um, but if you have a patient that's gonna soil a mattress or something like that, we do have the impervious mattress protectors that you can put on that. That's if you know, we would also have you, something else they're vomiting or something like that. Not necessarily for everyone, but I wanted to put them out there so that we do have them as well. Um, consider isolating off the patient if you can. Limit the number of EMS clinicians that are caring for them. And many of these patients, unless they're elderly, probably aren't gonna be that critically ill. We're not to the point working with MIMS yet to where they're not gonna go to hospital, but it is something we're looking at into the future. And I think that if this breaks containment and this does we get the sudden rush we'll see times when we don't take them to the hospital. It'll probably be something that looks like a physician directed non-transport or something. I don't know what MIMS will call it, but we're working with them on some contingency plans to go along with that. Um, but initiate your care. So a lot of this is routine um, stuff, but one thing that's really important is to get a travel history from them. And one that MIMS poster that was sent out, please, if you don't have it, call me tomorrow. I'll send it out to you. Put it in all your bags. Use it as a reference tool. What we are, we want to make sure everybody has the recent version of it, so I'm putting the dates on there. Um, we have a versioning issue as we're getting so much information. We want to make sure everybody has the latest version. I'll show you a picture of it in just a second. Um, but have an EMS officer respond. Let them talk to Syscom or to EMRC. Let them talk to um, help you gather this information. But one of the big things that we really want to do is provide early notification to the hospital that you're coming. Call them, tell them you're declaring this person as a, as a person under investigation. Give them time to direct you when you get there. Okay, so noti notify EMRC that you have it. EMS1 will get notified by the district officer. They'll end up calling me. I'll call the health department, let people know that they're coming in. We say that because we're not getting a ton of them now. Once we start getting a ton of them, I'm guessing we'll probably be telling the health department, yeah, we brought five last night um, because you know, the phone will be ringing a lot. We're hoping not to get to that part. Um, but follow the hospital's direction concerning transfer of care. Each hospital has its own set of rules, whether it be for visitors, how they're trying to contain this as well. We're gonna work with them with that, but we're also gonna take care of the patients. I can tell you most hospitals will go out and say, um, no nebulized treatment. So now you got somebody respiratory distress, you might be starting an albuterol going to them, and when you get near the hospital, they're like, you're not coming in here with the albuterol because they don't want it to aerosolize and spread throughout the ER. Comply with them, it becomes their patient at that point, we're gonna work with them. Um, or they may say, you know, if the person's really short of breath, they may say, just stay in the medic unit, let it finish your treatment, and then come in. Um, so we'll see, because they're gonna need a little bit of prep time for us to do that. It was kind of funny, I won't name the hospital, but one of our crews did walk in on the first day that they did this. And Jeff, how long did it take for our phone to ring? Um, they went in with an albuterol and somebody, one of the nurses screamed, nebulizer! And everybody jumped, ran and put an N95 mask on. You'd have thought like somebody dropped a bomb off of this place. And the poor provider's like, what? It's just a damn albuterol. And they were going nuts. But the hospital really went crazy on that because that's how they were trained. But each, part, each one of them has a different set of things that they're looking for. Um, and then follow the hospital's direction for transfer of care and then clean it, de de decontaminate with that. Keep the doors open, wipe it down. A good way to just say this is, what would I do for the flu? 
because it is pretty easy to kill. So, you know, with our disinfectant wipes, you, nothing crazy has to get on. Wipe the stuff down and go back in service. You, you don't need to be out for hours and all that kind of stuff. This is the latest MIMS poster. Again, it has all the different ifs and ands. Just follow that. Um, we're on version 3.0 right now. This is the one that ought to be out there. So again, visibly soiled stuff. Use anything that comes from our dispatchers. Or if you just look on the back, will it kill the coronavirus? Um, is it virucidal? If it is, you're good to go. You can use that. I can tell you what we, what we issue and a lot of the stuff. It is coming up in shortages. They're going to eventually say, just read on the back, and if it says it kills it, you can use it because we're going to run into that much of a shortage um, with this kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's pretty much what we have there. So we did come up with a checklist that goes up and just kind of all the stuff that I just talked about. Keep it in the bag. If you get somebody who has a person that's under investigation, pull it out and follow the thing. Um, keep copy is most, most up to date. It'll basically say um, all those different things that we had. Did I notify EMS one? Did I notify the district officer? Did I give pre-hospital notification, early pre-hospital notification? Did I limit this? And it's right on there. You can go right down. And then it'll have something on there about e-meds. Make sure you go in, hit this was a person under investigation. Yes, Dr. Barron. Do you have a copy of the checklist? Um, Mm -hmm. So uh, I do on my computer, I'll send it to you. And then um, we're going to send that out. I'll send that out again. And we need to make sure even if we get that on our, hopefully on our forms library or something, we want to make sure that we can get those out there. Because it's just, we've talked about that at many of our meetings about the ability to use checklists just for quality assurance, just because you make sure that you've done everything. So this is where we're trying to put that in just to kind of help people make sure that we're, thing. yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. So what you're saying is a lot of times these patients that already have, already have chronic COPD or asthma, stuff like that, they already have their own nebulizer and it's well within our thing. We can assist them with their home medication or with their um, albuterol and it, Yep, inhaler, yep, and, it's, and that's covered on the protocol to be able to do. Um, so, again, that, so the one thing that we will say is N95 masks, not necessarily for single use, okay? So if they're not soiled, they're not degraded, you can use them for another patient, for another patient. Now, obviously, if this is clearly, you go in and it, you know, the person just left Wuhan, China, and, you know, he, he took the stop before he saw the squeegee kid from our previous speaker, and he stopped in Italy to have a, something to eat, and then he came here, and he has a fever, and he has a cough, and we know that this person's going to test positive. Put on a different N95 mask. Nobody's saying don't use common sense. But if it's your fourth fever patient today, and none of them had respiratory distress, but they're coughing, but they have a little bit of a cough, you can use that again for, for another thing. Um, the hospitals, they recommended providers write their name along the side of the mask or the strap, not on the face of the mask. Good call. Yeah, so, so writing your name along the side of it or on the strap is a good idea for your thing. And then we, 14 is also given bags that you can put it in so that you can um, store it and it's not in there getting around the dust or the other carcinogens that are coming off a of turnout gear, things like that. Typically, before all this hit right now, we're worried about this. Um, I don't know how you guys do it on the volunteer side. I can tell you on the career side, it was normally in the back compartment with the turnout gear that we normally sat boots on top of. So that's, um, we, we did put out some stuff so that people could probably store that a little bit better um, than when they were doing that. Above all, you know, if you do get a patient with this, still, uh, I can't say this enough. I say it all, just about any time I speak in public. Keep their patient confidentiality co confidential. Um, when we do that. So I told you some hospitals, they have signs posted with this kind of stuff. Um, it's important, to, some just additional point, important points. Um, it's important to consult with them early so that they can be ready for it and be ready, be flexible. Um, so far, like I said, we've had probably 14, 15 cases that I'm aware of, all of them. I can't say enough about the providers, the supervisors, the engine crews, career, volunteer, it didn't matter. They've all been managed in an incredibly professional um, manner and we want to keep it that way. 
we really anticipate to see some spikes up in the next couple of weeks. One of the reasons that we're seeing so many positives right now, you've probably been reading on the news, but we have been up until just last week, they were really only testing in two places in the United States. Then they opened that up to all the departments of health across different states. Then they opened them up into certain hospitals. Well, just recently now, they've opened it up to Quest, LabCorp, and places like that. And there is more testing that's going on, so we anticipate to see more um, spikes that we're, we're seeing that stuff. Um, just some things you guys can do. Um, anybody hasn't been on their MIMS site in a long time, log on, make sure your email address is updated. All these things that are coming out, that are coming out from the state, they don't just come to me, they go to almost, they go to every provider. So go in, update your email address, um, that they'll do that. We already talked about how the public health chain come in and kind of talked about how, who can test. Um, that's one there. So not single use, um, they can be reused unless they're visibly sold um, or they're degrading. And when all, all said and done, please go in and you know document this as a person under investigation to EMEDS. We run a daily report. I report that to the health department in case for some reason I didn't get alerted through dispatch or through the CAD page or something like that when we have that. Yep, questions in the back? Um, yep, so we have two questions from mm -hmm. online. The first is, are the N95 fit test hoods being disinfected between every person that was not noticed in a recent testing session and the hood itself could be a potential vector? Yep, so that was brought up today when we talked with the officers on A-shift, and that's been, that's been um, sent over to the special ops people in the hazmat, and they'll be looking at that. And the second question is, will crews be notified of someone they transported test positive? So just like any other infectious disease, yes, they will. So one of the questions that frequently comes up, um, and I don't know if that's what they're alluding to or, or not online, the question comes up, it will crews be notified if somebody tests positive? Yes, they will. Um, and a lot of this is a public health activity, so a lot of it will be coming through the health department. Questions a lot of times come up about quarantine. Will I be quarantined if I took a patient? There hasn't been a documented case where somebody who's wore their PPE, where it's transferred over into an, um, a health care provider. I can tell you some of the stuff with the, I'm just looking at, CDC has put out some guidance that if we run out of N95 masks, they're going to switch it to um, surgical masks as their recommendation until you can get more N95 masks. The, um, but when the question of quarantine comes up, that is something we would take as an individual. If, if you didn't have your PPE on, you had a person who was, sorry for hitting that, if I aggravated the people on the um, phone. But if for some reason you had an agitated patient, you had a violent patient, and they had that, and they ripped your mask off, and they exposed you or something like that, we would take guidance through Dr. Branch and the health department with that. So we would refer the case to them. They would look at that. Right now, one of the reasons that I refer these cases to them each is because there's a whole public health algorithm that they would go down. They would look at your contacts. They're going to come out. They're going to interview anyone that you can touch. So that's why this whole thing right now about travel history, they've been able to kind of track these down to certain people who may have been the person that um, caused the, or the people around that were infected and they will go through all that and Dr. Branch we would refer and we would get seek guidance from the health department to see if somebody ought to be quarantined and that's kind of what we would do um, when it comes to that. Any other questions are good questions kind of the same things we've seen today and the issue with um, the fit test you know that we've addressed that this afternoon so Chief Hughes oversees special ops and he's following up on that. Any, what you got there? <laughs> so, so what's the incubation period with that? Again, they're not 100% sure with that. Some of the things that they're, they're looking at is we do know that you can be asymptomatic for a long period of time. Normally by day six or seven, you're showing respiratory complaints. Um, some type of a respiratory complaint and you have a fever. Um, there are cases that are reported where they're not. Also, the other thing is how long does it live outside the body and on what types of services that it does. The latest and probably most conservative thing that we're seeing is about six hours, but there are reports where they're saying it may go a little bit longer, but probably not as virulent when they do that. So six hours is something that we did just in the fire department. We changed our cleaning schedule. A lot of the county buildings, they changed their cleaning schedule to Q6 hours because of that, 
the um, evidence that they're getting through the research so that we're doing more frequent cleaning schedules and we're hitting all the things like your door handles and all that stuff so if you guys have people in your stations that come in and, and you want to clean i'm pretty sure you can't do q6 hours but i'm thinking montgomery county county where, where, where they pay their people to come in and clean their stations and stuff like that. But if you do have a new duty crew coming on, it may be a good idea to hit all the things, doorknobs, handles, frequently used areas, and you know do that within the stations. I just read something today about the median uh, latency period being 5D. Wow. So 50% of people are having the coronavirus are going to have the virus And so down, for those online that couldn't hear it, Dr. Barinold is saying the median latent period being five days, which meaning that patients would have symptoms right around five days, some less, some a little bit more. Any other questions? You know, yeah, I'm, thank you guys. I know it's late, and this isn't as fun as putting stents in and dissolving clots and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it is important stuff. It's not the sexy stuff, but this stuff really does work. And I, can't, I can't, just can't say it enough that people will follow what we do. If we take this serious and we show that we're doing this, if the people don't think people are taking it serious, go into any hospital right now, they're all taking it really serious. This is, it's not a time for concern, but it's time for a healthy respect of it. Yes, sir. There's a question online. How would you recommend handling an 18-year-old college student with symptoms but does not appear to have respiratory restrictions? So again, they probably would not be considered a person under investigation because they wouldn't have the end with that. Now, if they have a fever, right, so it was, but they didn't have respiratory distress. To me, once we start getting in this type of environment, flu season, we're put, we should be protecting ourselves, putting a mask on anybody who's coughing and who has um, a fever. So that, that's just good patient care. Um, but something like that. So it's kind of fixing itself for us, at least for the next two weeks, because they sent all the college kids home. So we're not going to get a whole bunch of those, um, at least for a little bit. But but again, ju just general patient care there. I would not alert that as a person under investigation because they wouldn't meet all three. Again, could that change in the next week? It absolutely could. So more guidance. So um, good patient care, but it's not necessarily doesn't need an IV, a full workup and all that. But certainly isolation, protective equipment, transport if, if need be. I do believe if this takes off that we will eventually see a time when we're probably not transporting every person, but that'll be, you know, whenever we look at this stuff, we just want to make sure that whatever we're doing is inherently safe. Just like we were talking earlier, you know, the non-STEMIs, they're the ones that worry me all the time because we look at somebody and we say, oh, Mr. Such and Such with your 10 over 10 crushing chest pain and a normal EKG, you're not having a heart attack, but there's a whole separate group of people that do and they're the dangerous ones, exactly what we're talking. So we don't want to minimize something down we, we want to walk that line of good cl clinical judgment and I think that that's where we're at with this so um, good stuff any other questions no more online no. guys thank you guys very much for giving me the opportunity to come out and talk to you guys <laughs>